What is Cash for Keys and how can you use it without being burned? You're going to find out today with Michael Haas. Welcome to the Real Estate Agent Success Tools interview series, where we interview successful agents and share their secrets with you. You're going to find out how to save some money and time and headaches today with Michael Haas. We're going to be talking about cash for keys and how to use it effectively and not get burned. Um, Michael and I have known each other for gosh, probably a couple of years now, met on Bigger Pockets. We both yeah, uh, really enjoy working with house hackers. Um, yeah, yeah. So, Michael, tell everybody, you know, again, who you are, where you're at, what you like to do. Yeah. No. Hey, thanks for having me on, Chase. Uh, I feel like you're my. We'll kind of just get rolling. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No. Hey, thanks for having me on, Chase. I feel like you're my uh, my brother from right across the border. Right. We're both jamming right. on house hacks and rental properties and in all the same spaces. And, and Portland is not that far away from Seattle. So I'm glad you're doing well. Um, yeah. Glad you're doing well too. You're crushing it. Hey, keep busy is good. Keeping busy is good. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. I mean. It, our market is a lot like yours, Chase, I'm sure. We have had tons, 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 tons of changes in rental regulations since COVID. Um, it kind of accelerated a trend that we've seen in Seattle and, and places like Portland and pretty much all these kind of Western markets where rules are becoming both more stringent and then also rules are becoming just more complex, right? So so a lot of mom and pop investors are having trouble keeping track of it. And, and one thing that kind of impacts house hacking is well, is like buying properties with existing tenants, right? Um, 60 days is what the bank looks for in order to occupy a home for a primary residence loan. And if you're buying an occupied property, 60 days is, is becoming increasingly short to actually move a tenant out of a rental property and occupy. Yeah. So all, for people who don't know or haven't purchased yet, especially all you aspiring house hackers out there, when you purchase a property that you're going to live in, the bank requires that you're able to move into it within 60 days of closing. And if that's not able to happen, at least on paper, then the bank won't actually loan on it. So, um, Michael, you guys up in Seattle have seen a lot of the regulation changes to where it's difficult to get people out of the property within those 60 days. So yeah, tell us, sorry to, I interrupt you, but uh, keep on going. Yeah, no, I mean, I mean, the, the 60 day limit is, is one of those things that used to be okay. just a non-issue, right? Um, we used to just figure that, hey, mm -hmm. most places are 60 day notice, 30 day notice. You just have to have month to month tenants or a vacant unit and, and you give them notice and you move in. But month to month has kind of changed here in Seattle. We're at a point where depending on the property type, mm -hmm notice can be as long as 90 days and that's 90 full days. So if you're in the middle of a month, um, it would be 15 days to get to the end of the month, then a full 90 getting you to a 105 Whoa. days notice. And this is on a month to month tenant, mind you, this isn't someone who has a year long lease. You're not breaking a lease early. You're just giving a month to month tenant notice that you'd like to move in. Um, that's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. So, so what, like, it, Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Keep I know you go ahead, Chase. No, well, I was, so this will parlay right into our, our cash for keys conversation. And really this conversation doesn't have to be only for people who are looking to house hack, but it's just a good solid way to go about cash for keys for any tenant in any market. Um, in Portland, when someone's looking to buy a property to house hack, if one of the units is vacant, that's the easiest thing, you know, just, okay, great. Buy it, move in, you're ready to go month to month. Um, it's a little less stringent as it is in Seattle to where um, we have to give the tenant a 90 day no cause notice of eviction. So we have to juggle the timelines a little bit. And basically what we do is we have to have the seller serve that 90 day notice of eviction like 35 days before closing. So then we close and then in the bank's eyes, the tenant has to be out within 55 days therefore allowing the, the tenant or the client to move in after 55 days or they can satisfy that 60 day window. Now in Seattle, that's like you just said, it's essentially impossible because they have to give sometimes, well, 91 to maybe even 120 days. So, yeah. uh, and it depends on the, the property. Today. Yeah. The interesting thing here in Seattle, and you can tell me, I'm not sure if you have the same thing in, in Portland chase, but we treat single family homes and single family homes with accessory dwelling units differently 
in the rental code than than duplexes and triplexes. Yeah, we we are one to four units is the same. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah, since in our market essentially there's two ways to give notice to a tenant on sale, and we do have just cause eviction, so you can't just give notice with no reason. You need a reason. One of the reasons is, hey, I'm selling the property. One of the reasons is, hey, I'm I'm occupying the property, right? So the seller could give notice that they're selling. The buyer could give notice that they're occupying, but the buyer can't actually give notice of occupying until they own the property, right? Under contract mm. isn't good enough in our market. Right. And the catch and what is kind of catching people and, and getting, getting house hackers in trouble is that sellers can't give that notice on duplexes and triplexes. They can only give notice that they're selling the property on single family homes. So you get a duplex or a triplex and selling the property is not a reason to remove a month to month tenant. So now we're at a point where you can still give notice to occupy, but you have to wait for the transfer of property to do that. And of course, 90 to 120 days, just you're not going to get it done with, with the 60 day requirement from the bank to occupy. And then we get ourselves in this pickle where, hey, we're going to need to come up with some kind of cash for keys arrangement. We're going to need to find a win-win here so that this seller can close on the deal. We can buy the deal. And the tenants are willing to move out voluntarily, right? There's no mechanism on a duplex to move them out earlier. Voluntarily sign something and say, hey, we're going to move out. Um, and that, that gets us into this interesting game where depending on how you think about landlord-tenant relationships, it can either be like a really fraught, stressful negotiation where both sides are, are angry at each other, or it can be a situation where you can look for a win-win and try and get something where maybe no one got 100% of what they want, but everyone is happy with the end result. Right. So in Oregon, uh, in Portland, we have relocation fees, and I'm sure mm -hmm. there's something along those lines um in in seattle but so let's let's jump right into the cash for keys so let's say you've got a buyer who wants to house hack sounds like a duplex would be kind of tough because of those yeah. uh eviction laws um how are you overcoming that yeah so on a recent transaction what we ended up doing is we had a buyer they wanted to occupy a duplex over in over in kind of the north seattle ballard fremont neighborhood Long-term tenants were there, they were paying below market rents, but they were good tenants, right? They were paying on time, took good care of the unit, great people with good jobs, nothing wrong. They just happened to be stuck with a seller that was selling and a buyer who wanted to move in, right? So one thing that I always try and do on my end is, is try and keep the conversation really cordial, right? Um, it's not anyone's fault, right? The seller is selling because they're trying to re their, reach their financial goals. The buyer is buying and, and probably occupying because they don't want to pay 25% down for this duplex. They want to buy it with a low down payment loan. And the tenant is paying on time, right? No one's done anything wrong here. So I think the trap that people get into both when they're buying a property and negotiating with a seller and when they're negotiating with their tenants is they kind of take this stance that they're right and the other person is wrong. You need to get out and you need to let me know what we need to do to make that happen, right? Which in reality, I'm honest with them. And I say, hey, you these are your rights. You have 90 days, 120 days to move out. Full disclosure, it's significantly better for us if you take less time, right? So I'm going to try and find a win-win with you here. Pay for your moving expenses. Pay for your security deposit on the next property. Full disclosure, you're, you're going to be asked to move out anyway, right? It's, it's whether it's 60 days or 120 days, et cetera. Um, but since it's better for us for if you move out early, we're willing to give you some incentives to make that happen. And... When you take it from that tack, people may not be happy about having to move out, right? But at least they don't feel like they're not respected and they don't feel like you as the landlord are throwing your weight around or, or being unfair to them. And we get a lot better results that way. And then of course, with multiple unit properties, you also have the built-in fact that you can give this offer to multiple tenants, right? To figure out who's willing to move out. Um, by being friendly with them, they're more likely to work with you compared to what I've seen more aggressive landlords who kind of shoot themselves in the foot. They come in guns blazing, making a bunch of demands. The tenants all bond together and they say, hey, we all talked. We're willing to move out for 15 grand. <laughs> and then they all kind of hold tight at that unreasonable number. That's what mm -hmm. we want to avoid because the reality is that we're in a little bit of a bind as the landlord and as the new owner. And we want them to be reasonable and we want to help them out. But at the same time, if they come up with some absurd number, there's not a lot of things we can do to, to get them to come down on that. 
So yeah, yeah, yeah. Trying to use a little so, bit of the charm offensive. Yeah, well, you got that. I can already see it. You know. Yeah. Um, so then, walk me through the logistics of it. You have an accepted offer, or yeah. does it start before that? You know, what's it, it like? Take me from beginning to end. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it should start before that, but the reality is that the rules change so often that a lot of people find themselves in this situation when they're under contract and they weren't aware that it was going to happen, right? Um, ideally, you find out before. If you find out before, you can have an honest conversation with the listing agent and with the tenants about your intentions, right? But let's say we, we put a property under contract and three days into contract, we just realize, oh crap, this timeline is tight. Usually what we do is we reach out to the listing agent and to the seller and say, hey, here's where we're at. We need to get a concession from the sellers or from the tenants. Can we get their information and can we get a warm introduction from you to the tenants? So we're not reaching so you out typically, out of the blue. You personally typically make that contact with them or do you have the seller or listing agent or property manager do it? I typically do it myself as the agent um, and ask for the seller or the listing agent to make that warm introduction. Mm, Ideally, okay. there's there's a little bit of a relationship there between the existing landlord, the seller, and their tenants. So that warm yeah. introduction makes sure that they don't think it's a scam or they don't ignore our email or ignore our calls, right? They know that this is what's happening. And and I try and play 100% good cop the whole time, right? Because the reality is that we want them to cooperate with this. And, and if they cooperate, I think there's a really good opportunity for a win-win where they can walk away with some money towards their next property. And if they don't, a lot of times there is no other option, right? Clients aren't going to buy this house for cash. They're not going to not get a loan. So the other option is walking away. So once I get that warm introduction, it's a matter of sending just a quick email, nothing too heavy, trying to get a phone call or a Zoom call, right? We don't want to dump four paragraphs of everything that's happening on these unsuspecting tenants that are in the middle of the work week. We just want to introduce ourselves, say that we had some questions, say that we wanted to talk about next steps and their plans now that the property is changing hands and set up that phone call. And then during the phone call, we can build a little rapport and get into the, the meat and potatoes of, of what we're hoping to happen. Got it. So so I get a phone call. Uh, it's this charming realtor, Michael Haas. Um, and then I say, sure, I would... I would entertain something like that. What are, what are the next steps from there? Because, you know, I've heard the horror stories and I've been the person involved in the horror story where I paid <laughs> cash for keys and it didn't work out, right? So like, yeah. how do you like, and, and how do you satisfy the bank too? Yeah. So in our experience, the bank is just looking for anything signed by the tenant with a move out date, right? Um, the best way to do it is to have the tenant actually give you notice that they're moving out on a set day. So the tenant sends you a letter that says, hey, on December 12th, I'm moving out. That way the bank sees it as voluntary, right? And then mm. you have a separate agreement that says, hey, if and only if you move out by December 12th, we will pay you $1,800 towards, which you can use towards moving expenses, next property, whatever. Um, by having two separate agreements, it's a little bit easier to satisfy the bank I have also done it with one single agreement that says right there that we're paying cash for keys and it says right mm. there that the tenants are moving out. Um, but sometimes it helps to, to just separate those two and then have the tenants give you voluntary notice. Um, one thing that we always do is we do cash for keys on move out, right? So it's not paid. That There's a reason why we call it cash for keys, right? It's, it's not paid until we're standing there in an empty apartment with the keys in our hand and it's paid by cashier's check or cash or some other form where where it's done right there's no there's no backing out of it there's no there's no bounced checks or bounced payments right at that point everyone parts ways and everybody's happy and that's probably one of those deals where everybody's really nervous or yeah everybody's like is the other side going to hold up to their to their side of the bargain and you know we've all been to those interesting scenarios where you show up to a property it's dark and it's rainy we're in seattle and portland of course it's dark and rainy and it's like um you, you got the stuff man it's like I, I got the cash you got the keys <laughs> yeah it's so, a little like western showdown we got going on yeah yeah but i mean in, in all reality we're human beings and we we think that things are going to go sideways and south and bad and awful and it's going to be a shootout western style right but what we found is that people are very 
amiable, amicable. There's yeah. some fancy word in there that I want to that I want to use that I don't know how to. But um, yeah, I mean, so I would guess at that point when you have an appointment with those tenants, what's just is it like a hundred percent success rate, or what's that? How does that usually play itself out? I haven't had enough of these, truthfully, to have like statistically significant numbers. But I think we've done three cash for keys in the last year and all three of them played out kind of as as designed right one of them was an actual payment nice. 100 percent success rate 100 percent success rate three for three right i'm not going to promise that to everybody, but, <laughs> but the reality is 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 yeah that's that's what i hear is pretty common the, the reason that cash for keys works is because it really is a win-win situation um to some extent yeah got it got it well man um yeah, with ever-changing landlord-tenant laws, it's really, really important that you start working with a realtor who knows what they're doing because you can get in a lot of trouble in a very short amount of time, especially with the litigious environment that we're in now. And Michael, some of your, all of your information was great, but the whole, you play a good cop 100% of the time, you find the win-win, you acknowledge that everybody's doing what's in line with, with every, everything's ethical. Um, and keep in mind too, that, you know, we get, I don't know if you've experienced this, this might ruffle feathers, but I have experienced sometimes you get these people who want to become investors off of different websites and they come in with a hard nosed attitude and they yeah. don't realize they're working with other human beings. Yep. And the best way to win with other human beings is empathy and seeing it from another point of view. And even if it's tough, you have to kind of take the high road. Um, yeah. and if you, if you need a, a realtor in Seattle, who knows what the heck he's doing, contact Michael, he'll get you in. I mean, um, he'll help you out with, with all that. So, um, with that, Michael, if people wanted to, to contact you, um, how would they go about doing that? Yeah. Hey, thanks for the shameless plug chase. And, and same to you. It seems like you're really killing it up in the Portland market and know what you're doing and are really doing the best thing for your clients there. So. Nice work. Um, well, you can you. find me online on, on Instagram. I'm just Michael J O Haas, H A A S. Um, online, just househackseattle.com. I'm there. You can always feel free to reach out to me. I'm super responsive with questions. And I believe that really owning rental properties, house hacking is, is one of those like golden keys to financial freedom. It's been good to my family. So I'm always happy to help other people get there. Yeah, it, it's been good to us. My wife and I are house hacking down in the Portland area. Uh, it's great. Never too old to house hack. Um, yep. And, you know, if anybody's looking to house hack in the Portland, Oregon or Vancouver, Washington areas, I'm happy to help you out. Uh, you can send me an email at chase at mrhousehack.com. Uh, scrolling across the bottom there. Uh, you can always send me a text at 509-393-9123. So, uh, Michael, I want to say thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. Uh, I'll end the broadcast, but go ahead and stay on, and I'll, I'll say thank you again after that. But uh, thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Hope you have a great day. And if you have more questions about Cash for Keys, feel free to reach out to one of us, and we are more than happy to help. All right, thanks, everyone, for tuning in, and we'll catch you next time. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for watching the interview all the way to the end. If you liked it, please comment down below and like the video. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our channel so that you can stay up to date on everything that we put out. If you wanna see more interviews just like this one, check out this playlist right here, or you can let YouTube help you out and watch this video right here.